you want to introduce me? Yes. So uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us to uh, this uh, live Zoom session. And today we have a very special uh, event. So I'm very happy to uh, announce and to, uh, that my dear colleague Anne Elster is going to give a guest lecture today in our operating systems course. And she will be talking uh, and giving some interesting details from her, well, decades of background in high performance computing, parallel distributed systems. So today we'll uh, have a great insight into yeah, large scale computing and the operating system technologies for this. So yeah, the stage is yours, Anne, please. Thank you, and nice to have, nice I can come. I haven't taught operating systems since I did it at University of Texas uh, in the nine, end of the 90s and then 19, uh, 2000, I guess, and one here at, uh, in, in uh, Trondheim. But uh, I haven't exactly ignored operating systems, as you probably can tell from this title of this talk and where we're going to be going with it. Now, to many of you, these um, topics will be uh, very familiar or maybe somewhat a review, uh, but I figured that doesn't hurt you. Uh, and if I, I am Norwegian, yeah, Norsk, so you can pose questions to Norwegian. I just, uh, I'm lecturing in American English since that's where I spent 20 years before returning to Norway in 2020. Uh, I've been told I can also do British English, but most people prefer that I do it in American English for some reason. I guess it's all the gaming you're doing or something like that. Uh, so that was why I spoke as a child, but um, we'll continue in American English. Let's see, now I have too many things on top, so I can't. So there are several useful resources I will highly encourage you to look at after this lecture that for further deep dives into details, because obviously I can't cover all the topics that was in that title in one or two hours and have a thorough uh, review. And, and some of the slides actually from my lecture are uh, beg borrowed and still stolen, if you wish, from uh, these uh, resources. Um, the MIT lecture is very nice to, to uh, look at for introduction to virtual machines. There's also the slides that you'll see some of in this part of this lecture from Stanford. There's IBM has some nice uh, short videos for those who like eight minute videos on the crash course, what's like containers versus VM. And, uh, and there's a very nice tutorial um, on a Docker file you can find on YouTube. Of course, uh, after this course, uh, you can learn more about parallel programming um, and containers and things like that from a parallel computing course that's taught this fall. And um, some of the materials um, that I encourage you to look at is also from the advanced OS course at MIT that was last, uh, taught last fall, uh, where I've also included a couple of, um, of slides. So I'm, I'm not sure how much of this I'll cover, but I'll try to cover as much as possible. First, I want to uh, talk to you about why, you know, you had a lecture on security last time. And why should you care about like, uh, security? You know, we shouldn't just open all the computers and everybody can use them and do whatever we want. And systems should be, be, um, be just open and free, right? Well, there's a couple of cases where you really, really should worry about security. Uh, you know, on airplanes, we worry so much about it. We actually have used technically three isolated systems running, voting on just about anything to make sure the plane stays afloat, right? And, and so two systems can crash and you can still land the plane. Um, we haven't been as thorough with, for instance, in medical equipment. And one of the tragic sort of disasters that's really put this into light was in 1985. It was this, this, uh, there was this radiation therapy machine that had, you know, of course, an operating system and some interim handling. And, you know, and was, was it basically the dosage that that machine was supposed to give a cancer patient was controlled by software, right? Uh, but one didn't think about security as one does today, because this is the incident that really made you think about it. Um, what happened was they hadn't thought of that operators, as they were putting in, you know, parameters, you know, weight and things about the parents, they got faster and faster at it. And um, they got so fast, they actually bypassed, you know, the, the, the IO, you know, interrupt from the keyboard was actually interrupting uh, faster than the interrupt handler was setting check on things. So what the end result was that about six patients got really like several, like, like massive over radiation. 
and actually got you know lethal doses of radiation, especially over time. So in a six month period, six people got either, you know, it's critically hurt or died. So, you know, when you write software <laughs> that causes people to die, that's like a really bad thing. So obviously this started a whole lot more about, you know, how you do software engineering, how you do security and, and you know, things, you know, you need to think about how you handle interrupts and not to mention you should, of course, you know, if you know something is lethal, you should never allow the machine to, to, to send a lethal dose out, right? I mean, that's the basics. Now, Hendrik, are you saying something? I just, um, okay. So, um, yes. Another spectacular bug uh, was the Spectre bug. Of course, you may have been mentioned that last class or not, I don't know. But that was that, you know, you notice that this, is, this um, bug that we had with the Therac was a timing bug, right? Because there was the timing of the, of the input that, you know, the input came in faster than they expected. That was the, at least the gist of it. And there's some other timing bugs, you know, when if, you, if things are timed correctly or incorrectly as it may be, has some severe impacts. And one of the more severe ones in recent times, you know, what basically came to light in 2017 and 18, so you may actually remember this, was the timing attack uh, that the specter represented. Now, timing attacks itself also uh, on, on the OS level um, or, a pro or processor level actually dates back, uh, you know, to 2002 and 2003. They, you know, um, advertised some from NEC, and then in 2005, some uh, Open SSL, which you do for, you know, web page or uh, internet, uh, web browsing. Um, the Spectre bug was a branch prediction vulnerability in the x86. Um, but it also actually had, uh, AM, they say AMD and ARM suffered some of, of these uh, aspects. And what it uses was a child, uh, side channel uh, timing attack to then uh, gather access to private data. Bra private data can be all, you know, really bad things like passwords or you just don't know what they are, right? The point is you don't want people looking at your private data. And one thing that was actually severely imp implicated by it was the JIT um, engine used on JavaScript that it finally that you know made a web page uh, vulnerable. Uh, so basically, a website can read data stored in a browser for another uh, another website, uh, and the browser memory itself. And there were just several other types of you know vulnerabilities that was found. And one another one was meltdown, uh, and there were several versions that came out over that time period. Now you could say, well. This, of course, disturb. You could see, like, you know, the industry was scrambling. In fact, Microsoft were first sending out patches uh, to their biggest clients. You know, Intel, same thing. So the, you know, the little the mom and pop shops, they were not protected. Whereas the big company, you know, they got basically paid uh, Microsoft and Intel to basically patch their systems for them as soon as possible. And so the and their software. So this was another sort of. Uh, jarring uh, revelation to a lot of people is that how how impacted one that how scared one were of doing of um, how to handle these uh, attacks and of course um, side channels the reason one use them is so because you, you want or branch prediction in general because you want to speed up your process and want to know ahead of time so you can you know load the right data in time and you know do all those nice speed up things but you, when you know how to stop it then of course you are now idling a lot of processors. So you can then ask the question, how much more, what was the impact or the slowdown for, uh, of this bug for, for quite some time until it came up with some solutions? Oh, no, I'm not having my... And of course, there was a fix, um, sorry. There was a fix to these. Um, and so here was a, 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 a sort of a, uh, a list of these vulnerabilities that Spectre presented. You can see it was the bound check bypass, the branch target injection, uh, the rogue system register read, uh, there was a spe speculative store basis. So there was a lot of sort of, you know, versions that came out as you see from tw between 17 and 18. Um, and it of course needed some kind of, um, some of them needed uh, or did firmware, cause firmware changes. Some just uh, did some window changes, uh, but by and large, um, they um, they all had um, fixes to it. Um, 
I think this is a. So uh, the other one um, that uh, we had that was, you know, as spectacular, we're even further back, uh, was the Pentium bug, known as the Pentium FOO bug in 1997. And that affected basically all of Intel's. So now the, the, the Spectre bug was, you know, impacting several architectures, um, but it's, you know, Intel being such a dominant architecture, especially in the 90s, uh, the fact that it Im impacted most of the Pent Intel P5 or Pentium 5 architecture was very severe. And this is a classic sort of, uh, you know, operating system level uh, bug, if you wish. Um, uh, you know, how do you, how you set privileges on your uh, microcode, right? So if you did this compare change of eight bytes on the EX register, um, which is this, um, this C7 CV8 um, describes, now the FOF actually show, shows you this is a lock on this comp uh, compare and exchange instruction. Uh, and that did not, the problem was that it didn't require any special privileges. Now, the, now you think that if a register was specified a memory, uh, it shouldn't be allowed, but because you had a lock on it, which was used to, um, sorry, which was used to, um, uh, normally used to prevent two processors from interfering with the same memory location. Uh, that's why you, you didn't have these special privileges uh, but given that that was sort of misused and, and still allowed, caused this Pentium bug, right? And so the CPU can then erroneously uh, lock bus cycles to the, uh, read the illegal instruction, and then it will just sit there. Well, it's expecting a write back, but it's never getting the write back. So it's just idling. And the only way it can recover it's to restart the processor. And obviously that's pretty severe if you have to reboot your CPU for whenever <laughs> this uh, instruction uh, comes. So, so that is another very uh, interesting or severe bug, right? So like I say, it uh, was fixed with, of course, this uh, OS patches. So in this case, you could patch it with the OS. Uh, and then because otherwise you can easily have this um, instruction issued and you basically uh, have a denial of service attack. I mean, you're spinning the processor into just waiting for that bus right. Uh, there was a second, uh, a second official workaround from Intel. Uh, it's the one that you know sort of became the sort of official standard way of fixing it, and that was to um, propose keeping all pages, uh, you know, basically all present in the memory, but marking the first page as read only, so you can't do anything of that in, in the beginning of the page. Uh, there's a lot more in, in, you know, information out there on this pension bug. It was quite a, a spectacle, as I said. Um, but you know, it's yet another example of, of how operating systems and hardware uh, can cause a lot of problems if they're not done right. And if you don't watch out for you know, ill-intended, you know, that's the sad part, you know, after after the internet worm, which I also talk about it, you know, we start worrying about, you know, ill intent. And that leads me to the internet worm. Now it was released, I'm actually old enough to remember this. And I actually had a firsthand experience with it too, since I was at Cornell when it was released. It was released on November 2 in 1988. Uh, a date goes in infamy as far as computer security. It infected over 6,000 mainframes, uh, VAX computers in less than 24 hours. Actually, that's wrong. It's less than 24 hours. Um, they you know, say, well, what about 6,000 mainframes, most like universities, what harm can they do? Well, the problem was it wasn't just at universities. It was at companies and people used you know, uh, those uh, also at military sites in the US. And I'm telling you, there's one organization in the US that not takes kindly to break-ins and having their computers um, stall, and that is the DOD, Department of Defense. So this was, um, became a quite um, you know, spectacular one. Uh, now in Norway, we haven't heard about it as much. And do any of you know why Norway wasn't affected as so much. Can any guess as to what happened in Norway? What made Norway so protected from this bug? 
was actually kind of just a single event that helped us and why it in Norway is not talked about as much. Any ideas? It was actually fortuitous that we had a very uh, alert guy sitting. We had a single node into Norway uh, from the US and that person was actually on call and actually alert and heard about the US uh, going down and unplugged Norway from the internet, the main trunk from the internet. And that's why Norwegian companies got saved you know, by isolating themselves. It's like, the, it's how we're handling the pandemic, right? By isolation, it's really the same way, right? We're just isolating, Norway isolated itself. And, and, and then of course, stayed isolated until they could patch themselves and so they could their, uh, plug themselves in. And um, there's um, this whole uh, worm is also known as the Morris worm and named after Robert Tappan Morris or RTM. And he was the first that was convicted for computer um, break-in in the US by the, you know, only two years before had they gotten the law that, you know, said breaking into a computer is illegal and you could be punished for it, right? That's a federal crime. Now, have anyone guesses to what Robert T. Morris does today? He's lecturing at the university, yes. Does anyone know which university? And that's right, it's at MIT. He's an MIT professor, just like me. Uh, so he, he and I were grad students at the same time. Uh, he did get kicked out of, um, kicked out of Cornell. Um, I, he, pro he was actually the one who taught me X windows. We were in the lab together. And I remember being very offended uh, when I asked him what program he was working on one night, we were sitting there both hacking. And I thought it was a, looked like a programming language, you know, something for a programming language course. So I asked him if it was, it looked very structured. And I asked him, was the programming language course? I said, no, it's just some C code. And I, I thought, gee, he just thinks I'm a dumb blonde or something. So I was kind of, in, you know, very offended by him. And then of course, two days later, the internet goes down. So maybe that was why he didn't talk to me because most of the people, when I talked to them in lab, they were more than happy, almost too happy to tell them me what they were doing. But uh, anyway, so that's that's my little story about the worm. The other one is that I helped the um, our system people and who then forwarded to F uh, the FBI to find, he had actually posted on Usenet before he launched the worm, some patches, that the five, attacks he used and their patches to them. And uh, I, I guess was annoyed that people weren't following up on them, but he did post them and I actually tracked them down on what the then called Usenet. And this is a, Usenet is a story to you guys, because you know, back in those days, Usenet was only something computer people used, right? There was no internet, but we had these talk forums called Usenet, but they, they were dumped into the World Wide Web. And there were definitely fora there where I think people were writing and saying things they had no idea would be put up in the open. And, and for now, their you know, mothers and grandmothers could read whatever they wrote on some of those uh, social.culture. You know, whatever, but um, that's a side story. And that you never know the security of what you're doing until the technology changes, right? So and that's a sort of a heads up. So maybe uh, these days, you know, searching in videos is getting easier and easier. So maybe it's a heads up for that whatever videos you are about there. So what did the worm, this Morris worm do? Well, it exploited, uh, you know, holes, security holes in um, the Dex Vaxen, the, were the big sort of compute servers at the time from Digital Equipment Corporation. And Robert had actually worked a summer job there. So he knew the architecture intimately. In, because it worked with them and knew exactly how many registers and how, how big you know, user space is and all those, de those uh, system details most people don't memorize. It also worked as a sysadmin at Harvard as an undergrad. So he had just joined as a grad student when he did. So there was a whole in debug mode of uh, the Unix SendMail program. That was one. So SendMail had a dash G flag that people you know, installed SendMail but didn't take away after install. And then it left, you know, some trivial passwords to go in and in the same send mail demon, and then you can get access root access that way. 
There was also uh, a lack of overflow uh, detection for the finger daemon. So you could, there was a um, Unix command called finger where you can sort of look up another user and get some information about them. And uh, since it didn't limit the parameter list, I mean, it didn't have a fixed parameter that was open, you could actually write and continue writing into system, system memory. And if you knew where in system memory you were, of course, then you could again gain uh, root access. So that was two of them. Uh, there was also this whole thing with R login. It was very beautiful. I loved R login myself. I was writing my thesis and I used to be on one computer and then I'll, whenever I log out, I'll have an R daemon just go into our, our login into another computer and update all the files that I have changed very you know, seamlessly in a nice little script because it was nice and open that way. Well, the problem was the people that had set that up towards, you know, this is how Milnet got infected because there were some people had R logged in themselves from, you know, unclassified machines to classified machines. And if they broke into the unclassified machines, they automatically now broke into the classified machines. So since then, of course, we don't use R login anymore. We now use SSH. That presumably is, is more secure. And of course, the most secure computers don't even allow SSH access. Um, he also had a rudimentary uh, uh, password clacker. And I say it was very rudimentary because he basically did a dictionary lookup. And uh, one of my colleagues at Cornell, uh, professor at the time, uh, I will not say who because he lives in, <laughs> he had a, a password called tomato. And so tomato was, of course, not a good uh, password. I was instantly cracked. So he also uh, got. But the biggest problem of why it really brought down, I mean, this is for cracking the system. So why did this internet go down? They actually started crashing. I mean, I remember that night I was sitting on the, actually the ECE VAX uh, in the electrical engineering department was one of the first sort of test attacks. And I noticed it got slower and slower and finally I got so frustrated with it. I remember logging in and I was like, ah, I'll just fix my program tomorrow. And because it ran out of inode, it just kept on, uh, replicating. Now, that was actually a coding bug. He was intending, he sent a byte worth, for every computer he broke into, he sent a byte uh, destroying that computer over to a computer at Berkeley. And he launched the whole thing from MIT to make it look like it's coming from MIT. But the pro problem is it replicated itself and it didn't have a cap on or hadn't tested the cap well enough it was a, so that it slowed down and ran out of I know before his own test for handling that it took effect. So basically it crashed the systems. It ran out of resources by just, you know, um, spamming the system with, you know, this worm that uh, replicated itself. Of course, there's a lot more details you can uh, read about this. Uh, and here are some pointers. Um, but, you know, it's, it's an interesting, um, you know, like I say, personal experience for, for, and got me interested in computer security and, 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 and things like why, what operating systems and parallel systems can do. And as you see, some of the slides here are actually from Robert T. Morris, because he gave a great lecture that you can find on YouTube on virtual machines that's highly relevant for the lecture. So you actually can hear his lecture after this talk. Um, after my lecture today, you can go and hear his lecture and he'll give you more uh, details on virtual machines than I do today. So uh, I talked about operating systems and hardware bugs, and then how are you then how can you then isolate code? You know, how can we prevent some of this? Um, what if the code, you know, you don't want that code to run all over your user spaces, right? So, um, and these slides are from the Stanford talk. Um, so of course, one of the reasons you want to find codes is that what if you have a legacy operating system, you know, like an old one, like old Windows NT or God, goodness knows what, uh, and or just an old uh, System 5 Unix <laughs> program that really requires the System 5 stuff. Uh, but, you know, uh, you don't want it just, you know, you can't just let it onto a modern one because there's so many holes in it and whatever. So you want to combine the code on a legacy operating system. And an analog here is that you, you want to have a firewall and hopefully you can then behind it have a hopelessly insecure server as long as you put up a big enough firewall. 
Um, now you can't fix this, no source or it's too complicated. So you don't want, so you don't want to rewrite this code from scratch. Uh, but you can reason about the network traffic, you know, coming in and out. And you can similarly block untrusted code within a machine. So you can try to encapsulate, you know, an instance, you know, of your know, program running on some kind of operating systems within a system and have the OS limit what the code can interact with. So let the operating system handle uh, what it can interact with so it doesn't do something bad, like running into you know, system memory or take too many resources or whatever the problem is. So uh, one idea would be to change the root directory, right? I mean, if you do ch root, so if the kernel stores the root uh, directory of each process, the file name now slash refers to the dir, and accessing in the dir now returns to the, this directory. Uh, and you need root privileges to, to the uh, ch root. So, but the problem is you can sub subsequently drop that privilege. So uh, ideally these change root processes wouldn't affect other parts of the system. Uh, even if it's uh, still running as root, it shouldn't then be able to escape it. But in reality, there are many ways to cause damage outside the DIR, outside the DIR directory. And so it's not really a solution. You can also um, re-change re, uh, root to a lower directory and then change root. But uh, each process then has one root directory process structure and you can implement the special cases. And, and But the only the problem is it does not always change the current directory. Uh, so you, it's not really getting you anywhere. Um, you can create devices that let you access raw disks, for instance. You can send signals or ptrace to non-zero processes. You can set uh, UID programs for non-zero processes. And you can bind privileged ports, mess with clocks. You know, God knows what you can do with messing with the clock, right? Um, so, you know, but based bottom line, it was not meant for this, right? It's not intended for security. Um, the FreeBSD jail attempts to address the problem and also Linux C groups or control groups and namespaces uh, try to address it, uh, allowing containers. And they are actually some of those container features that we'll talk about later. Um, but by and large, you can see there's, there's some challenges here in having the operating systems sort of build itself, uh, encapsulate that, uh, that those um, uh, applications, old applications. And I, uh, there's the process is why can't Ptrace and other debugging facilities used to, uh, to be used to control these untrusted program. And the problem is that just most any damage must result from a system call <clears throat> and there again, so words, delete files, you can unlink and overwrite files, you can open rewrite, you can attack over a network, uh, use a socket, uh, you know, by a socket, so you can leak private data. And so, you know, there's so many ways you can attack the systems. And I don't know, how, some of them you probably covered uh, last time, Michael, but I just wanted to sort of refresh some of the ideas. So this is Definitely not. Even says, why not? Is this is this not a solution to all a panacea? Well, it's not. Absolutely not. Right. Um, <clears throat> so, it's basically it's very hard to know the exact implication of a system call. Uh, there's not too much context not available outside of the kernel. With like, what does this file descriptor really mean? Number really mean, and the context dependent. Um, and there's indirect paths to resources like file descriptive passing, core dumps, or unhelpful processes. And not to mention, which we worry about in par parallel computing, there are race conditions, right? That's sort of the panic. Here. Now, that's a, a real stickler in parallel computing. We worry about race conditions and trying to, and load balancing and, and, and you know, synchronization of processes that all comes into play when we do try to do parallel computing. Um, and now, you know, it's just, obviously there's lots of issues that open themselves just to that. And like I said, the race, there was a race condition or a timing issue with that Terec 25 event, right? Where the interrupts, you know, came in faster than the, the keyboard interrupts handler came in faster than the other interrupt handler. And so, you know, there's obviously one type of race condition in some sense. So the question then, can you look at, oops, 
what is an operating system? Well, hopefully you know that once you're taking this course, you've been sitting here all semester. I hope you can answer this question. Otherwise I worry about Michael over there. Um, you know, we basically have some layer of hardware, right? And then we have this OS, so-called operating system level. And on top of that, we have editors like Emacs or VI and compilers as GCC or whatever your fellow Fortran compiler is. And, you know, you can have browsers like Firefox or, um, you know, the, you know, whatever, whatever your favorite uh, Google uh, uh, browser is, you know, many, any kind of uh, also applications, right? So the OS is the software between the applications and the hardware um, external reality, right? And you, <clears throat> so it makes, it tries to extract the hardware. So you presumably don't have to recode everything from each type of here hardware, it makes some abstraction and you don't have it to code in zeros and ones, right? And makes finite resources, memory and number of CPU cores. Um, at, you know, a much um, large, you know, appear much larger, just like, you know, when you do virtual memory, yeah, you know, it's like you can pretend to have more memory, but you're really swapping in and out. And not to mention it, it prevents the processes from, you know, and users from, you know, accidentally or intentionally hurting each other, right? Um, so that's that's the other, uh, that's why I talk so much about the bugs, right? So this should all now be motivation for why we do virtual, like virtual machines, you know, why we want to virtualize things, why we want to virtualize the hardware uh, and then put complete operating systems on top of the virtualized hardware, sort of as an extra layer. So in this case, you have a lower level OS, which is the virtual machine monitor that I'm, I think uh, Michael has talked about, uh, hypervisors. And then you have the virtual hardware with, a, with another operating systems on top of it. And then you have your applications on top of that. So in this case, the Emacs and GCC will on one side and you have the browsers and uh, whether it's Firefox or your favorite um, Opera uh, or you know whatever, uh, browser you like uh, running on the other one. Um, so the process abstractions look just like the hardware, right? It's some, in some sense, so you just have this, uh, you know, have just have a whole extra abstraction layer. Now, to understand the differences between processes and hardware, I thought this was a good slide. So in the processes, and we talk a lot about processes in parallel processing or parallel programming. Um, in the processes, they basically have non-privileged registers and instructions. Uh, they you know, access virtual memory, uh, whereas in hardware, you have the actual real registers and instructions, and you have both virtual, of course, and physical memory, and translatic look ahead buffers and page tables, et cetera, right? Um, on the processes, you have side you have errors and signals, whereas you know, on the hardware side, you actually have you know architecture traps and interrupts. And uh, on the process side, you have file systems, directories, your files and raw devices, and of course, you similarly have I/O devices, uh, and uh, you can that are accessed using I/O. You have a DMA, direct memory access, and interrupts. And so now some of these are allowed by to be accessed from the process, but they're still in isolation. And we will talk maybe a little bit more about it. We'll see what time I have. So a virtual machine monitor is that this layer that's sitting and on top of the hardware that allow, you know, between these operating systems uh, and applications, right? You know, you, you think of them, these operating systems running on top of this uh, virtual machine monitor in some sense. And to each of these operating systems above the virtual machine monitor, the virtual machine monitor is sort of acting as, as the hardware, but it's not really, it's really just an abstraction. Now the whole idea of virtual uh, memory machines is actually goes back to the sixties. In fact, the IBM 30, I thought it was 360 I used in 81 actually had it, uh, you know, because in the olden days there were, the computers were four, very few. In fact, there's, I think it was an IBM guy who said the maximum number of computers ever 
one would need is five or some, for, <laughs> something like that, you know, big machines that everybody logged into and we had terminals. And then you spin up your sort of your, your own little VM. Uh, so it, mo it multiplexed multiple OS environments on expensive hardware. And that's what it was, big expensive machines. And that was very desirable when we had um, very few machines around. But then in the 80s and 90s, you know, the personal computer era arrived. You know, I got my, I bought my first, uh, you know, IBM PC in 1982 and cost $3,000, but I bought it instead of a car. That's how expensive because $3,000 was a lot more in back in 1982. It's very expensive even if for a PC, but it was at least, you know, doable. It was millions of dollars. And still hardware got much cheaper. I wouldn't say cheap by today's standards, but it was got cheaper, much cheaper. And so you put a Windows machine on every desktop that was became standard, at least for industry. Maybe not everybody had their own PCs like today, but you know, it became more and more popular. And of, but today we still have VMs everywhere, right? Uh, and then but we use it for a different reason. And hopefully now you know some of the reasons, you know, for security, but it's also um, another major reason we use it in HPC. And can anybody Imagine another major reason why you should use a, a virtual machine or a container actually, more typically, but sim similar ideas. Any, anybody has any ideas? Why do we care about VMs today so much? Reproducibility is, is a good answer. Uh, you know, you want to be able to, you know, know exactly what sets of components of, of um, you know, your operating systems, your libraries, your compiler version, you know, all those, you put them together uh, and you want to be able to reproduce it on a, you know, uh, and maybe also um, on a different machine, for instance. Any other ideas? Well, it's a little bit related to that. Of course, we talk about the security issues, but um, also just just making sure that all the packages are compatible and not interfering with each other. Because you will be surprised once you work a lot on GPU computing, like me, for instance, GPU drivers on a given operating system, you know, may require a certain operating system, and an MPI may that we talk about later today will also require a certain version of the operating system, and they better be all compatible. And if you, you know, one of those get upgraded and they may break, right? There are other stuff, but you don't want your stuff to break. So what you can do is put it in a container and still have it running with the latest and greatest uh, Linux, you know, 220 point whatever. But, you know, the rest of the stuff may actually be only working on 18 point whatever Ubuntu, just to give an example, right? Uh, and it may actually break certain drivers and God knows what. So that's another one. <laughs> and you can use it to explore malicious software. <laughs> and on the flip side of that, you can use it to develop current operating system kernels is what's the actually uh, answer I was looking for. <laughs> but yeah, I guess that's another way of, of saying it. You know, when you want to do kernel development, you know, when you build an operating system the way I taught it in 19, uh, you know, around 2000, is that, you know, you have a dedicated PC and you just play with it and you're going to break it, you know, um, but it's nice to actually uh, play with, you know, kernel features inside a virtualization box, and then you don't have to, you know, worry about the whole machine itself, right? So it's actually used a lot for kernel development. But I guess the flip side of that, exploring malicious software. Now, some of the benefits of a virtual machine monitor is that, you know, just like we mentioned here, software compatibility can run pretty much on all software. It gets low overhead and high performance, near raw machine performance for many workloads, and can trick to having a uh, sort of a direct execution on the CPU or MMU. Um, it's seemingly told data isolation between virtual machines. Of course, it's com some complicated side uh, channel attacks like Spectre, and it can leverage hardware memory protection uh, me mechanisms. And then you mentioned all, you know, um, encapsulations, they're not tied to physical machines. So you can have checkpoint migration and um, also reproducibility. 
Uh, there's also backward compatibility is the bane of new processes. So you know, it's a huge effort to require to innovate but not break because there are so many codes out there that take so much time. It takes so much more time to develop all the applications in the world and it takes time to you know, either you know, generate new hardware or generate uh, new operating systems or compilers. I mean, the, the, the effort on the application side is enormous. So there's the, it's enormous resistance to breaking old code, right? And many of the security considerations makes that, of course, just about impossible. Uh, so you can um, close the security hole and break apps or be insecure, right? Um, and another example of this is like the window XP I mentioned was operating system. Actually, um, the, pri the previous version to that was Windows NT. And that was the, when DEC went under, Digital Equipment Corporation stopped the hardware, Vax VMS people to do their um, Vax, uh, Windows NT. And if you look at the back end of uh, Windows NT, it looks like a badly written Vax VMS actually. And XP is a sort of a, <laughs> a follow up on that, but that's another story. Um, and basically 4.59% of all machines ran in 2001 Windows XP in 2018. And that's a pretty scary number that that many people are still using a machine uh, 17 years later, right? The support for it, of course, ended in 2019. And of course, eventually such hardware will die, but what do we do with those legacy applications? Not all will run on later OSs. And so you can actually, I think you have had several cute program uh, projects, uh, Michael, where you have generated old computers and old you know, OSs on, on old hardware, <laughs> simulating old hardware, right? It's very, very possible these days. And so you can have a VMM, of course, roll both Windows XP and Windows 10. Um, and of course, uh, I have a, I, sh I have a, a summary we probably also have. I know Michael has this pre preference for, you know, Linux, uh, you know, which is the, you know, the one that came from after Unix, Unix based, right? The, that we saw, or we talked about earlier. Now I could have, for, I don't, I kind of ran out of time for this time slot, which I expected, <laughs> but I wanted you to <clears throat> stop here and say there are, very much many nice slides from Stanford that tells you how you implement virtual machines, the binary translation um, way you could do it, and hardware assisted virtualization, also memory management optimization. And all these topics are covered in the, in the slides I, I mentioned earlier. I guess I should have put them in here, the references. Um, because now I see it's uh, three o'clock and we probably should take a break. What do you think, Michael? Yeah. I think that's a good idea. There's already quite quite a lot of interesting stuff covered. And I think you gave quite quite some good, you know, insights into topics I maybe barely only discussed on the site. So that's great. And I did you you never told me you knew uh, Robert uh Tepin Morris in person, so that's fascinating. <laughs> I guess it's not something I put on my CV, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not. I mean he, he went to jail for a couple of years for, for, for his break and attempts, right? <laughs> yes, and the, and the you know a little interesting side story about him is that his father, like I told you, worked for um the, at the same at the time for NSA, so it's quite embarrassing for him because he was actually head of computer security at NSA and then his son was breaking into bringing down the internet and but the, but your father couldn't be too mad because he wrote the first uh, computer bug a sort of for the computer uh, virus uh, a worm and that was known as um, core wars that he wrote on the system five machines at Bell Labs when he was there before joining the NSA and that was back in the 50s and it was you know was basically sort of a, a kind of a computer game where you could like eat up the the computer's core uh, or take its memory resources. And um, so, yeah, it's fa like father, like son, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's fascinating because there's so many links to this, like uh, these core wars are also related to cellular automata, which, which are really fascinating. So that's what got me fascinated, you know, this game of life stuff by, by Conway, who I think passed away last year, uh, yes. where, where you have these re self-reproducing organisms and Actually, I, I read an article in a computer magazine when I was like 14 or 15 years old. And I think that got me hooked into computer science. Like there's life inside of a computer and it's so fascinating. 
<laughs> yeah, and it still is. Yeah. And yeah, you know, there, there's people doing research like in, 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 in these things like Stephen Wolfram. So from uh, yeah, this mathematics and uh, whatever uh, scientist guy uh, running, running his company. So uh, there's so many fascinating things outside, uh, out there. Yes. So that movie, of course, Core Wars was actually, you know, coined after that, uh, that bug that he wrote for or that, that program he wrote at the Bell Labs just for fun to see how much yeah. resources he could chew up. So yeah, in the and, then, and a couple of decades later, uh, Unix came out of Bell Labs. So it's, it's amazing how much stuff actually came out of Bell Labs that really influenced computer science for decades. Absolutely. And it's just the telephone company, right? <laughs> right. You know, that's what's the, when I said System 5, that's the Unix that was developed at the Bell Labs, right? And BSD is from Berkeley, uh, originated Berkeley. And of course, all of these merged eventually and developed into Linux. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. So, so of course, back just... to VMS, the deck, the deck machines had, um, were not running Linux or Unix, they were running VMS. Um, yeah. Which, which is just the uh, an acronym for virtual memory system, which uh, I think the first version came out in 1977 on the UX11780. And so this shows that virtual memory was actually so new and fascinating that people actually used it as a product name back then. Right. And now, well, you have virtual memory everywhere. <laughs> Right, of course, no, but of course, IBM's had virtual memory before that. But anyway, uh, of course, but they didn't need to advertise it because they were yeah. selling their stuff anyways. <laughs> yeah. And... In fact, if you want to be like cute about uh, history, and this is another talk of mine is uh, how bull computing, you know, uh, that uh, you know the bull sequina, which is a big supercomputer, has it norm from bull. Bull actually came from Norway originally. Actually, wrote was the first, you know, the first computers for like counting machines for um i'm just uh, talking now but um they were for the business machines to do is to census data to count census data you know like and so an ibm that was the that's the precursor to ibm that's what they were doing and this there was actually this this guy bull in norway went to sweden and saw this ibm displayed went back and thought he could do a better one and he created this machine that was actually better and it took him a while to get acceptance for it, but it, and he, he died in the you know, late, mid late twenties, but then his company lived on and got uh, taken over and moved, moved to you know, Switzerland and France. And the name is, is still exists at the ATOS through the Bull Sequina oh. performance computing. And for a while he was actually proven that he was making bit better business machines than, than IBM. So that's sort of a fun Norwegian story. So yeah, had some real computer pioneers in Norway. Yeah, and it's fascinating that, that most of this is actually forgotten. So if you ask a, an American who invented the first computer, well, of course, it was Eckert and Motley, right, to the ENIAC. And it was really invented in Europe. But, well, over on the other side of the Atlantic, actually, nobody knows. Yes, and, so, and, even, Europe, and even here in Europe, we don't talk about Bull, who actually did that, that uh, you know, fantastic machine before. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, at least we talk about Konrad Zuse in Germany, and it's it's amazing because I, I never met Konrad Zuse. Unfortunately, he passed away like fifteen or twenty years ago. But I I know his son. Well, his son is also seventy five years old now. But he was actually a, a a small kid when they built the first computers after World War Two, and uh, the first computer there was actually the first one in Europe, the Z four which was running at ETH Zurich for the several years. And now it's at the German Museum in Munich. So it's fascinating. You can go there, watch that machine. Unfortunately, that one's not running anymore, but they built yes. several replicas. So yes, computing history is great. And you know, here at NTNU, we have a great computer museum that we're actually working on, on uh, yes. getting an exhibition running again. And there you can ex actually experience, we have these old wax machines running VMS. We have all right. no NOSH data machines, which I have never seen before. And I think I know quite a, a large number of old computers and, and like old artificial intelligence machines from the 1980s, which were especially built for, for running Lisp and stuff. So oh, the old AI languages. And, and of course here from an HPC person like me, we yeah. have the shell of the old uh, XYP sitting in the, inside of, outside of F1. It's like that big red monster with the cool little seats. Mm -hmm. Now, because this was the Cold War, all the internals of it had to be shipped back to the US because they were too afraid that Russia or other evil people would get copies of 
or could reverse engineer it. But yeah. the shell is uh, sitting in front of our entrance to computing science. Yeah. So I encourage you to read that placard. And of course, the first uh, supercomputer we had here at NTNU in 1986 uh, is at the museum, in a technical museum in Oslo on the second floor. Yeah. And this Cray cost like 10 million US dollars and had about the computing power you now get in an iPhone 12. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so yep, yep. great, great chatting. I think that was a nice break. You want to continue or? Yeah, so I'm just making sure I don't have any questions from anybody or if there uh, anyone else who wants to, it'd be nice if one or two other people with, are there no people there now or do we have a couple of people not, there show their the chat, faces? But... I'd like to see at least a couple of faces before I continue. And I said, I think you said you can edit them out, so. So yeah, so I only see one camera turned on. Show your faces. <laughs> All right, don't be shy. Oh yeah, there's. Oh, there is one. There's one <laughs> it's just more, more nice. Hey, it's just yes, at least that's a couple. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> just walking at Michael. You know, I get bored uh, looking at him. Another one. Ah, hey. nice to see you, Jennifer. Yes. Nice to see you. Uh, one again. <laughs> so they're there. Okay. Good. Yes. And uh, how did you like it so far? Your other people yes. did it seem interesting. Yeah, well, at least one thumb up. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I'm in my I'm used to this kind of lecture style where I like I actually talk to students. I don't do recordings, so that's how I lecture. <laughs> sure. Yes. So uh, yeah, we can continue then. Um, uh, just th th I, I uh, start talking about bull, bull right, uh, the Norwegian pioneer. Who I encourage you to to Google. Uh, and the newest, biggest supercomputer we have at NTNU here today is this Bullsequina XH2000, known as Betsy, and it's one of the supercomputers uh, worldwide. And uh, Norway has actually been quite uh, in the forefront for this. In fact, um, like I say, we had the first Cray XMP in uh, 1986, and um, we have all, uh, also uh, now the ones we've had since then have been so high on the you know the very best super duper uh, computers. But you know, Betsy is a reason, uh, very reasonable, um, powerful machine, much more powerful than your laptop, I assure you. Uh, and But how do we then run things on big machines like this? Because now you have an enormous amount of resources and how do you, uh, do, you do you deal with them? Now, when I ran, so the first, uh, Peril supercomputer as a summer job in 1986 at Bergen. Um, we used the Intel IPSC, which was called the Intel Personal Supercomputer. I know NVIDIA claimed they had their first supercomputer, personal supercomputer, but that's not true. Actually, Intel had it. It was called the Intel IPSC and it was a hypercube. It had hypercube interconnections. It was the way number of degrees of connectivity between the processors grew logarithmically as opposed to, you know, exponentially if you do a fully connected. Um, and even logarithmically, you know, after about, you know, 100, 128, you know, it, it's, it's quite a bit of vastness of wiring, right? So uh, that's why, you know, you, you see switches and other things, um, although switches themselves are generally fully connected. But anyway, uh, we're now going to talk a little bit, uh, just mention some of the containers that you tend to use on these uh, big machines or even not so big machines in order to share resources and protect each other and all that good stuff. And not to mention build the software stack with the light drivers. Cause you know, when now you off typically, uh, for instance, Betsy now will have some nodes with A100s which is the a pair architecture from uh, NVIDIA. And so you'll have GPUs in addition and then you have to worry about the GPU drivers. And so there really are good reasons for, for running things with containers. And uh, so to compare the containers to the VMs, so in the VMs, we virtualized the hardware, you know, there were complete operating systems on top of the hardware that was virtualized. It takes a lot more space and it tends to be slow to boot because you have to spin up those operating systems on top of those on the actual operating system. Now in, in uh, containers, you're virtualizing the operating system, not the hardware. So there's no guest OS. Um, and you sort of have containers with processes instead. And that's how we think about uh, parallelization in, in parallel computing is, is parallelization of processes. Now, of course, today you also have, um, you know, multi-core systems, you know, I mean, even my, 
my, my smartphone, whether it be my iPhone or my Android, uh, they both have, you know, both a GPU, uh, multi-core CPU. Um, so, you know, to use those CPUs, you know, you know, you tend to use uh, threads, you know, like to put multiple cores on, on each, um, uh, but like for now, we could talk about processes and I'll get back to mention maybe some more threading and on the, on the tail end. So to use uh, containers, you typically use something called a Docker, the Docker system. Uh, and you do a, you create a Docker file to build a sort of, um, you know, recipe for what your program needs to run. Uh, in its little bubble. And it's actually good to Google this exact expression and anatomy of the Docker file, because then you'll find a lot of examples out there that are great. Um, and it basically, uh, you know, consists of, you know, you have a base init, you know, typically which Ubuntu or, you know, Ubuntu as you know is Debian based, you know, which version of Ubuntu and get, the, and that you don't build, you, you don't build the Docker file of that itself. You get it from this hub docker.com where you log into and, and you, you know, that's a free account. And you of course need to pick the right version of the operating systems. And then you can have some kind of environment you're running in it. Here's the node runtime, but you know, there's all the, that's other, and some of them like node will have actually Ubuntu inside of it. So you don't, you only need one of them, right? You don't need them both. And then you have the application that you actually wrote in whatever language and the compilers that go with it and the libraries. And again, the libraries, you know, especially <clears throat> and drivers need to be the right version. And then you have some kind of run directive on how, um, uh, how the whole recipe should be executed. And so it might look something like that, though this is very sketchy, but like I say, yeah, I, do, <laughs> I do encourage you to Google it and, and, and also see this um, video. Uh, I told you to take an hour how to write a, a Docker file. Uh, highly recommend it, but uh, you know, let's say we, you, you have some sort of, uh, at your prompt, you're going to do some in, inside the Docker, you're going to do from node to the, you know, the latest, uh, from the node version is the latest, you're going to run a link directory to your app source, and you're going to have a working directory where, where you're at, and you need to copy the, the package of the, of the, you know, how you're going to be executing it, and then you have, you have to maybe install, run npm install, and so you'll have these kinds of, of, of ex, um, types of instructions inside your recipe in order to build that, that so you can compile the whole thing. So it's a little bit more than just a make file, right? I mean, it's like a make file plus in many ways, plus the actual libraries, plus the actual blah, blah, blahs. And then um, you could also have something if you do a web app, uh, expose to port 3000, you know, here is the, exposing the port to the web browser. So that's also typical things that goes in, inside a container. And like I said, you know, I could spend a long time <clears throat> talking about just <laughs> probably a couple of hours just to how you do write, you know, good uh, uh, Docker files for good applications. You know, it's, just, it's a, you know, I've tried to make it easy, but it's not that easy. But once you get it going and you have a container, then you can, deployed everywhere and what you do as just like programming, you know, once you and, and make files, you don't actually write them from scratch each style, right? You don't write C make files from scratch. You don't write, you don't write um, even programs from scratch. You copy paste and, and then edit, right? I mean, that's why we have editors. Um, so, uh, because I want to spend more time on sort of the, my area of, of that's dear to my heart, right? Parallel computing and parallel processing. Are there any questions now? Or I know that was very sort of a little bit of a fluffy uh, description of containers. But like I say, they have some very good, um, this short video you can first look to really explore the difference between the VM containers and not to mention the more detailed where it's actually running you through how write a Docker file I thought was pretty good uh, at this YouTube link. So now we're going to look a little bit more about parallel and distributed processing. You know, the things we actually do in, if you want high performance uh, computing, we don't feel like the resources on one machine, 
is enough. You want to do big weather simulations, you know, uh, you know, protein folding, you know, there's so many things you can do that, you know, will outstrip the resources on the, of a single machine, right? Or even if it's multi-core or God knows what, it's just not enough resources, right? Uh, any kind of real time simulations. And even today, you know, even the, 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 the biggest games are also run in multi core, uh, you know, I don't know too many uh, real time applications that run on just one core these days. So they'll try to use more cores to be real time and improve the graphics or, or, or your physics or whatever you're doing. And Parallel computing itself has actually an impact on operating systems. And it's kind of a nice little article that just came out I think it was last fall or this spring. It's very recent on the impact of a pro parallel processing on operating systems. So that ties this subject back to that. And um, so that's something you, you, you can uh, have a look at. And you'll see, yeah, it was actually, sorry, it's back from 2009, but there's some more recent articles uh, on this and how, uh, how it um, impacts. And this has also a nice overview uh, of, you know, a review of, um, of what you see. Uh, so, you know, I, I uh, encourage you to go to that, that link. Now, why do we care about all these parallelizations? Well, that's because since 2005, processors haven't gotten any faster. You know, we used to, when I was your age, just wait a year and every all my applications would automatically run faster because I just buy a new computer and the clock speed was twice as bad, you know, twice as fast. And then obviously everything ran twice as fast, right? So, so no, no sweat. I didn't have to do anything. But what happened around 2005? Does anyone see what's happening there? Why did it stop? Why don't computers run any faster than three to five gigahertz? I mean, still three to five gigahertz. No, no, no one knows? The heat, right? Just, uh, so the, the clock, as you up the clock frequency, you just get dissipate so much heat. I mean, there's just so much, gets so hot that you just can't handle it, right? And as you, see from the slide already our processors were as warm as our hot plates or as burner on our stoves they were approaching nuclear reactors and if they continued they'll basically be like rocket nozzles and they you know basically heat on the sun <coughs> and by now they will be as hot as the sun itself and obviously you can't be having the sun itself on your laptop right i mean that's just not gonna it's a pretty bit of a uh, problem cooling in the thing, right? Uh, so we hit what was known as the frequency or power wall, right? Um, and that was hit already at the Pentium 4 before this Pentium 5 bug, right? When we already hit that. So that's how far along ago we've had to deal with this. And how to remedy it, of course, we've been doing parallel computing. And there's what's the activities of my, my grad students is that we, we um, look at how we can use, for instance, these deep graphics cards and several of them, preferably, uh, to, to, to speed up things in addition to multi-core and having many systems. And so the whole thing then becomes H, not high performance computing, but heterogeneous and parallel computing, which I now claim my HPC initials for my lab stands for, right? I know it's tongue in cheek, but hey. Uh, and this whole GPU part was actually inspired by students like you yourselves, you know, they're into gaming and saw that uh, even, before, even before CUDA, you could start looking at how you could use the power of those GPUs that were really meant for the gaming industry, you know, for people doing gaming. And then some, for some reason, some of you are still interested in games, so that's a big business still. But uh, I have to admit, NVIDIA now has even a bigger business in AI, so they rebranded themselves the AI company. But the, the theories we looked at since, you know, 2006 and how to parallelize across these things are still valid today. So what does HPC have to do with operating systems? Well, I've been trying to tell you all along that we also look at processes and we look at threads, right? And so we look at concurrency. And of course, the biggest issue, our biggest issues are the same as the issues 
or similar to the issues with operating system. There are deadlocks and starvation. So you want to use your resources efficiently. You need to synchronize them. Um, and then you need to do uh, multi-threading over course and multi-processing across multiple machines. Let's see, I have a question now. Let's see what it says. So, so if we have- A pretty good one, yes. <laughs> So if we want to uh, access modern gaming graphic cards, we should try to join the HPC lab. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, that's true. We, we are, I, I, I do try to get, I have a couple of 3090 cards, so I guess that's considered pretty good. And, uh, but uh, we also have servers like the DGX2 machine dial that other people access that has the Volta 100s and we are applying for uh, access. Yeah, you can apply it to access the A100s. But as far as pure gaming cards, I guess, yeah, I'm known to that and the graphics group, I guess the two of us have the better cards, I will admit that. <laughs> um, also to be run on an ID 80 inch monitor, right? But, uh, <laughs> but that's not why you should, you should join my lab because you like HPC. So, but anyway, so like I say, we also worry about multiprocessing across multiple machines, just the one you, that, that, which is basically what Betsy is, right? There's a multiple SMPs. Uh, and there's lots to be gained, right? <clears throat> Even if you uh, just uh, paralyzing on the processor itself. So, you know, we are so good at abstracting things. And that, I guess, you know, the whole problem of the VM versus containers is that you replicated the whole OS. Well, you can also <laughs> containerize or, or, or um, isolate yourself by, you know, just writing scripting, you know, you learn Python, you think you're very good Python and you think you should write everything in Python. Well, if you try to write efficient code, I hate to say, tell you, um, you're going to be short up on just one processor as um, Henry and Patterson uh, uh, based on Lysosin shows here, you can actually go get a 62,000 speed up on a single uh, processor, not core, but processor, um, in, you know, just Intel, you know, whatever, uh, by going, you know, first from Python to C, then you can do some parallel loops across, and, you know, the multi-core system you have, and then you can do some memory optimizations. And finally, you can use the vector instructions that are now on Intel. Intel actually has 512-bit vector instructions that you can utilize, um, which is makes gives pretty impressive performance. So you, with the light, if you call a library, library, uh, you could probably get to like close to fifty, and this is like finally tuned up to sixty-two thousand faster than just writing a triple uh, loop in uh, Python, and that's pretty daunting, right? And this is one of the reasons why you, if you don't uh, care about what, you know the backbone or wanting to optimize your code, you should at least call libraries if you have them. You know, if they, you have a BLAS, basic linear algebra or matrix library, call it. If you have FF, if you need to do an FFT, call FFTW library. Uh, you know, don't try to optimize it yourself. It's gonna take a lot of time and effort. But some of us actually like optimization and so that's the other side of it. And like I say here, you can see some of the, <coughs> Things you can do, you start with Python. This is the older version that they were showing at um, IBM. You can see that, you know, that's the absolute speed of F. You, you went to Java, that's a little bit better. Uh, went to C, you're using GCC, a bit better, 1.7 um, relative speed up. Um, and you, but you can see the fractional peak performance is still pretty dismal. Um, you could do, you know, some transposes and arrange your data better. You divide and conquer, and finally, you can see <coughs> an amazing, um, amazing speed up. So you get in this case fifty two thousand on the older on the older slide they showed from this this talk. And then you can see uh, if you Google this performance engineering course, software course at MIT, you'll see a lot of these slides that can tell you more about the details and how they went there and, and you know, it goes through a lot of this optimization you'll also find in your um, uh, compilers course, right? Go, goes through some of the compiler uh, directives and things. 
Now to talk more about parallel computing, I want to talk a little bit more about OpenMP, which is how you handle multi-core programming on the model and uh, on modern computers. And we also talk about P threads because I think this is what's most like, I normally teach MPI first because it's more simple in the sense that met, to do multi-processing across many machines, since the memory is distributed, you, you're forced to send data back and forth. So you, you have to be very aware of where the data is at all times. In high performance computing, there's three things you have to worry about. It's just like in real estate, it's location, location, and location. In the case of HPC, it's location of the data, look, whether it can be fed into the registers, location of the data as far as using the best algorithm that gives you the best location, and location of the data as far as bring the processing to the data if it's really big. And it's all about location. And so, uh, whereas the P threads and OpenMP is more about synchronization than these things that you do in operating systems. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm in, this, in this case talking about it first, because I think it follows nicely for what we just talked about. So here I'm using some slides that are based on Mary Hall from University, uh, originally at the University of Utah, and um, sorry, USC now at Utah. And we'll discuss uh, our memory systems. <clears throat> we do some review, uh, shared memory and distributed memory programming models, and some overview of POSIX threads, some OpenMP uh, parallelisms. Um, and then, of course, there are sources uh, that from their uh, course, the openp.org. And then um, Jim Demo and Kathy Yellick at University of California, Berkeley, also have some nice mater materials related to this. So what is shared memory versus distributed programming? Well, in this shared memory programming, you're going to start a single process and fork threads, just like you fork processes in operating systems, right? The threads carry out the work and communicate through the shared memory, and the threads will then coordinate through the uh, synchronization, also through the uh, shared memory. In distributed memory programming, you start multiple processes, and then they, the processes, of course, uh, do the work, and then I have to do send and receive messages in order to communicate. And then they coordinate also through message passing and synchronizations where there'll be barriers. Uh, so you have, for instance, MPI barrier, but you also, of course, can have barriers on the shared memory side. They're just different mechanisms underneath. <clears throat> but what you do have today, even on, lo on local SMPs, is you don't have a non uniform memory access. So, uh, even if this is just, if you have multi chips, which you tend to have anyway. So if we say you have several cores, now even here you have non new access on the cache level, right? Because you have a shared L3 cache and you usually have local L1 and L2 caches. But you know, across systems, you have a memory connected to this chip and a memory connected to that chip. But if you want to access the memory over here, <laughs> it's going to be faster to do the directly the one that's nearby than go through another chip, right? That's just the way it is. So that's why we get this non-uniformity known as NUMA. <clears throat> and of course, on top of that, when you have an interconnect you know, between them, then you have also this cache coherence to worry about. So the programmers have no control over the caches and what they get and what's updated. But of course you can organize your data to have a better access pattern. So for instance, if you want to do vectorizations, you'd like to stream it. That's also, it's pretty much what you do for GPU programming. You want to do a lot of streaming, all the data like right after each other in memory, right? <clears throat> and then of course, uh, they have, you have this, these um, shared variable issues, right? When you have core one and core one, it's core two. And the, the statements are not involving X, it's fine, but when you do involve, you can end up with these funny situations where you don't know what it'll be because of this lack of synchronization on the read writes, right? Now you can share, typically core share a bus, so you can do snoop on the bus. So you can actually look for when they're updating their, um, you know, whenever you are tr transmit a signal on the bus can then be seen by the other cores. 
and try to update it. Um, and that's known as snooping. Um, or you can have a directory-based cache where you have a hashtag directory that stores the status of each cache line and you see if it's been updated or not. Um, and that's probably some of the stuff you've already covered in this class, right, of cache variants. And of course, you can have a pool sharing uh, when multiple processors access the same cache line. <clears throat> but then uh, if you look, you can have a, uh, a race condition if you look at different parts of it. So that can also co cause coherence traffic. The bottom line is they, they tend to share these things on buses. And uh, you basically have a collection of parallel communication wires. <coughs> And as the number of devices connected to the bus increases, the contention for its use will, of course, also increase, which means performance goes down. <laughs> That's just the way it goes. Now, of course, you can have switch interconnects, which, you know, they're typically, you know, on a, you'll be sitting on a switch backbone of some sort for up to a certain level. But as I told you, when you start getting hundreds of them, or even thousands of them, or have tens of thousands on the supercomputers, uh, or even hundred thousand of them, then you know you can't have a hundred hundred thousand interconnect in a huge spaghetti. You know there will just be too much wires, right? And so you find uh, other ways to interconnect, and one of those is crossbars and other techniques. And here you can see one of those sort of cross simultaneous memory access by a crossbar switch. Now. One of the architectures that you can, that just was announced this week and I haven't made a slide of it yet is the Grace CPU that was an ARM, which is ARM based announced by NVIDIA this week. Where they tried to put the CPU and right next to the GPU and directly to its own memory bank to very speed up this whole memory, avoiding this whole PCI Express thing. But it's not, announced until 2023, but it'll be very interesting what it does to both operating systems and um, parallel computing in general, where they have, have this ARM-based CPU that's sitting there with the NVIDIA GPU. So something I want to just mention uh, that we're just not um, seeing yet. Now back to shared memory, you know, we have the dynamic threads. Um, and so the master thread waits for work and then forks the new threads when threads are done. Uh, and this is an efficient use of uh, resources, but the thread creation and termination can be time consuming because if you're spinning up and especially sh shutting down and then spinning up again, and lots of threads, that's you know rather inefficient. So you wanna make sure that you, know, you tend to have a certain number of threads around all the time and that you can do by what's known as uh, you know, static threading, where we have a pool of threads created that are allocated for the work, but then don't terminate until you're done with your program or you know, at least computational intensive part of your program. That has, of course, a better uh, performance, but you may also waste some system resources by having extra threads around when you don't need them. So that's like <laughs> you know, a cost benefit of what, you know, how you should do threading. Uh, and of course, it's the whole thing about thread safety, you know, and, and shared memory parallel function libraries. You know, you want to make sure that you are not, you know, that the threads are running in such a way they're not, you know, uh, overriding rare memory, you know, synchronizing appropriately when they're updating uh, memory locations and so on. Uh, and then, of course, some of the features of sequential code may not be thread safe, right? I mean, it depends on how you write things. And so you can think of you know, lots of ways of spinning up several threads and not be thread safe, if, you know, especially if you have write, read-write conflicts. Now, there are several thread libraries uh, out there, but the most popular ones um, that I want to cover here is the POSIX, P which is known as pthreads, because it's so close to our operating system. Um, and that's, in fact, the um, Ian Lusk, who was uh, on the MPI committee when I defined MPI standard, and I was actually on the MPI standards committee, so I can brag about that, but and when, we, when we wrote it, we didn't think it was become such a standard, but it's still used today. And we try to ensure that MPI would not um, violate thread safety, although we couldn't guarantee it. 
Uh, but of course, only one system, it's much easier to guarantee. And so you want to, and the nice thing about these POSIX threads is they're relatively low level and you, the programmer will get to express the thread management and coordination. So it's all up to you as a programmer and you yourself are decomposing the parallelism and managing the schedule. Uh, it's very portable because, you know, it's, it's sitting on top of Linux or Unix. Um, but it's, um, and it's the most widely used one for system oriented code and also used for some kind of application codes that really require low level uh, performance. Now, the OpenMP is a newer standard and then, although it's been around for 25 plus years, I know, um, uh, it, and of course it's evolving, you know, it's a higher level support for scientific programming to shared memory architectures. Uh, the programmer still needs to identify the parallel loops and so on, uh, and the data properties and guides the skit, but this guides the scheduling at the higher level and the system then decomposes the parallelism and managed actual schedule. And it actually arose from a variety of different uh, architecture pragmas. So for POSIX, like I say, it's the interface to operating system utility. Uh, it does basically system calls to create and synchronize threads, you know, like your system forks, uh, and can be relatively uniform across Unix-like operating systems. Uh, the P thread contains support for creating parallelism, you know, forking and so on, synchronizing, you know, barriers and, and you know, weights. Uh, but there's no explicit support for communication because shared memory is implicit. You're assuming that you have all access to the same memory and it pointed to a shared uh, data is passed uh, by a thread, right? So that's, that's uh, what you assume. So for instance, forking a P thread is sort of like a Unix fork. You, you have uh, its signature, you know, into, in it, you know, have an int uh, P thread freight. Uh, we have, of course, the P thread type, the constant P attribute type. Um, so you just want to create the thread. And then, of course, you, when you do error code P thread create and call it, then uh, you'll get the P thread ID is the thread ID or handle that's used to halt except for so you know which thread dealing. And a thread attribute has various attributes, the standards uh, obtained by passing a null pointer. And the thread function is the function that you're running uh, inside the thread, takes and returns void. And the fun argument is an argument that can be passed to the th thread function or thread fun where it starts, the function that you're starting and error code would then be set to not zero if it couldn't create it, right? So that's sort of basics. You can see how much like just any kind of Unix fork this is. This is why I was covering, I thought it was nice to cover P threads a little bit here as a review of, you know, forking in Unix. So <clears throat> here the master thread actually causes the operating systems to create a new thread, just like you expected. And each thread then executes a specific function, this type thread function. And the same thread function is executed by all the threads that are created. So in that case, it's like, you know, it's parallelized, right? And for the program to perform different work in different threads, the arguments passed that each thread can then uh, be distinguished by its ID, you know, the, the thread ID and other unique features of the thread, you know, so you want to access, you know, if you want to do a do add two vectors together, you need to each, each thread to act access separate parts of the vector, for instance. So a simple setting example here, you know, compiled using GCC with dash, uh, uh, library p thread um, so you can have an int main you get a you get it spin up 16 threads uh, then you have a tn for thread number and it's for thread number less from zero to less than 16 you can then create the threads um, and then you can uh, in the end for same threads actually join them so you kind of get you sort of you merge them together again uh, and note that the thread creation is costly, so it's important that the par function do a lot of work. So you want to use, uh, do a lot of work inside the, you know, the function that you're calling for each thread to do. Uh, if it's little work, it's probably you could just do it in a for loop, right? That's the, that's the idea. So for variables uh, declared outside the main are shared, 
An object located on the heap may be shared if pointers are passed. And variables on the stacks are private and passing pointers to these around the other can, can cause, of course, problems. So shared data are often a result of creating a large thread data struct. Um, and that can be passed into all the thread as arguments. So here's a simple example. We say hello world, and you can pass create the thread ID to null and whereas the message is the hello world, right? That's the sort of uh, P thread version of hello world. <laughs> Um, and of course, then the thread count will be set at runtime and that will tell you how many hello worlds will be sp sp spat back at you, right? So each thread will print event hello world from thread X of thread count, right? From the, um, in this print, the print function. Um, and then of course you need this um, in thread join, uh, P threads at the end to gather them up. So from a unique uh, specification, you just want to suspend the execution of the calling thread until the target thread terminates, unless the targets have already terminated. And the second parameter allows the, the existing thread to pass information to the back to the calling uh, thread, often set just as not null. And of course, you'll be if there's an error, like the convention of all programming in C, it's it's gonna or C plus plus, it's gonna be non-zero, right? That means it's an error code. So here you see uh, the full hello world program. So you will include uh, standard I/O and standard library dot h, but in addition you are including the pthread uh, header file, right? Which declares the various pthread function constant types and such. And then you just have this, uh, you know, you know, have set an integer thread count. You have this uh, uh, hello pointer to this thread function, right? Uh, called hello. And then in the main, you have this the th long instead of 64 bit systems. And so you have a thread type th and a thread handle. And you want to uh, get the number of threads from the command line. In this case, you can do it with a str. It's TOL, right? Uh, this is a standard way for getting the number from the command line. And then you want to actually malloc or allocate the memory of the size of this um, uh, p thread tape, right? Thread count times the size of p thread type. So now you, so you allocate the buffer if you wish. Uh, and then you can write, uh, you now can spin up the threads, p3 create. Uh, with the thread handles, and then you can say hello from the main thread. And then for each of the other threads, uh, you can also spin up. Um, and then in the end, you're going to be, uh, you, you know, you'll, you'll be doing uh, on the hello here, right? This hello function here. <coughs> and then in the end here, you see you're joining all the, pro all the threads and free the thread handles. And that's your sort of simplified uh, hello world in parallel on your multi-core system. And of course, once you've written hello world, you can do all kinds of things, right? So uh, in parallel. Um, so of course, if you want to do that, you should use lots of different kinds of synchronization and the easiest for or uh, synchronization is to just put a barrier, wait for all the threads to be done. For instance, if you have a huge for loop, a lot of things to different, you do, you don't want all the loops to be all the out of whack. So then you probably should use a barrier after each huge uh, computation loop. And uh, just like we'll also see in MPI, you can do these barriers across all the threads and make the threads work, wait for the slowest thread to finish. Um, you also have uh, operating system features, and that's why I'm enjoying uh, adding this slide here. So it says mutual exclusion, <coughs> mutual exclusion access locks. Um, you have P thread music blocks and the P thread mutex unlock. So that's um, well, again um, working a lot like operating systems ideas, right? Um, so, uh, but of course, just like uh, processes uh, in general can lock. So can these processes written in P threads. So if you have two threads and you uh, lock A in and lock B, you can deadlock, right? Because um, you can lock each other out. Um, 
Uh, and of course, there are many other forms of p-thread synchronizations. Uh, and you can see more of them in, if you take my course or work on the web. But at least it gives some, some ideas. And, and, and of course, all the types of synchronizations that it, I guess you have covered either in this course and or maybe even compilers. But, but it, I think so, a lot of operating system courses cover several forms and uh, condition variables and even monitors. And I'm not going to review those lectures here. <laughs> That'll be uh, too much. So, but you know, there's a P and V, right? For B and for Hoon, as we say, stem up first. Uh, of course, extremely useful features. So in summary, for programming with threads, you know, they're based on the OS features. So they're very close to this course. And yet close, you, you repeat them in parallel computing. Can be used for multiple languages. Uh, just needs the appropriate header. Uh, a familiar language for most programmers and I have the ability to share data if it's convenient. Now the pitfalls of course is that the data races are hard to find because they can be intermittent and deadlocks are usually easier than <laughs> because also be intermittent and you know but which if you have message passing and you know you're sending and receiving it's a lot more obvious who is having the data and what is being done with it. I mean it's sort of the program is forced to think about that. Now today we generally, uh, at the higher level, people typically use OpenMP as a simpler alternative, but it has some restrictions. And of course, to avoid those restrictions, we go back to pthreads. Uh, but if you're just parallelizing a nice for loop, for instance, it's, it doesn't make sense to have to go down to pthreads. You can simply parallelize it uh, with a few uh, annotations that specifies the parallelism and independence. And OpenMP, <clears throat> is basically a model for shared memory parallel programming. It's more portable across shared memory architectures. Uh, it's uh, scalable to uh, at least uh, across within the shared memory platforms and has incremental uh, parallelization. So you can parallelize individual computation in a program while leaving the rest of the program sequential. So you can just sort of take, if you have multiple loops, you could just attack the loop that's the the worst, you know, by using cache grind or while grind or any kind of profiler, you find that one loop is really the bad, the bad uh, performance. So you, you can parallelize that. It's compiler based, so it's more of compiler directives, if you wish, to generate the thread program on synchronization. And they uh, exist as extensions to Fortran, C, and C, and mainly by directives and a few library routines. Um, so, but the exact, uh, so they consider fairly lightweight because you're doing threads rather than processes. And I hope we already explained the difference between threads and processes in this course. Uh, we've gone through that, Michael, I hope so. Uh, and each, uh, exact behavior depends on the course of the, <laughs> of course, he says, <laughs> uh, so I wasn't going to cover that, uh, the open MP implementation and requires, of course, support from the compilers. Uh, now it allows the programmer to, to separate things into a serial regions and a parallel regions rather than concurrently executing the threads. It hack, it, what it does is it hides the stack management and then it has uh, certain synchronization constructs, just like you, for instance, barriers and other th things that allows you to synchronize processes and also some implicit uh, synchronizations between each parallel four, for instance. Now, it will not parallelize automatically. It's uh, not guaranteeing speed up. It could slow down. And it does <coughs> not prevent you from doing data, uh, data races, OK? So it's not a sort of a, you know, uh, end all uh, solution. It also uses the fork join model of parallel execution, just like pthreads. You know, it's threading after all. Uh, the begin execution as a single process, a master thread. And then uh, you start the parallel construct in a master creates a team of worker threads. So now you have forked and have several of them. And then you complete uh, of a, par uh, a parallel structure with a sort of an implicit barrel, barrier, a thread to synchronize. Uh, only the master thread continues then execution and then Implementation optimization, the worker thread spins and waits for the next fork. And so, you know, once you 
if you fork later, they're just sort of hanging around, but they, you don't really doing anything until you actually do it. And uh, the sort of big way to recognize an OpenMP program it has this funny pragmas. And there are special preprocessor instructions. So this is running the preprocessor, for instance, for a C or C++ program and adds to the system to little behaviors that aren't part of the basic C. So it's like an annotated C, if you wish. Uh, and pilot compilers then can decide whether to support them or ignore them, right? Uh, and but the iteration of the pragma is open PM. They can modify statement immediately following the pragma, and it should be a comp compound statement such as loops. So you don't typically programs have two types of data: there's shared data visible to all threads or private data. So here it's like uh, you can have MP threads. You have a global scope variables that are shared, and the stack allocator variables that are private. So you, for instance, you have some big data, you know, about 1024, and uh, some function foo, and you have some private stack uh, variables like int, uh, you know, thread ID, and then you have some calculations that goes inside the foo. But the big data is just big shared memory data, right? Uh, that's for p threads. Now, in, if you try to do this pragma in parallel, uh, you share where again the shared variables are shared in the private variables to private and default is actually shared. So you need to make explicitly, except for loop indices that are private. So you need to actually say that the thread ID is private. So that's the difference from here, right? You need to explicitly say it. Uh, it uses the single program multiple data or SPIMD model. Um, so it works within work sharing constructs to distribute it among each threads and teams. Uh, so, for instance, for C, C++ contacts, you can say set, uh, Tragbar on parallel, uh, for instance, on parallel, and the clause could be like four. Um, and then it can include the following, you know, a private list or shared list of memory locations. So if you try to do a Hello, uh, Hello World in OpenMP, you start with a parallel region to think about. Uh, the same before, the number of thread is thread from a command line and the code should be correct without pragmas and the library calls. And <clears throat> differences from p thread uh, is that you don't have to write in many statements because the sort of open MP environment takes care of it. Compiler takes uh, basically care of it as a free processor. And uh, just as you did, you did the call to the library of p threads with dash L, this is an implicit thread specifier. So you do um, GCC dash F uh, open MP, okay? Because here's the, this is a preprocessor. So a typical hello world uh, open MP program, just like the thread, you have the standard IO and the standard library. And here, instead of the P thread, you have open MP dot H. Uh, and you get, again, you get the cam, number of threads, same argument, same, same line. Uh, but then you do, you see a lot less, so this, this all fit in, in one page here, you said not before, I had several slides, and here you just do a pragma on parallel num threads, and here you don't even have a for loop, so you just say hello, because that's all you do, and then you return, and the whole room, it says, uh, you'll need to know what my rank is, so you can get my thread number with OpenMP get thread num, and then uh, the thread count is OpenMP get num threads, and then you can print a low world from my rank and my thread count. Um, and so that will be the hello printing from all the other threads from the, not from uh, that. <coughs> and it will print from all of them. And this is also very similar to how you would do in a hello world program in MPI. Uh, uh, because here we, you will also need, you know, the, the, the thread number, we'll, we'll call them rank. And of course, you also need to know the number of processes. You know, so the process uh, the process number you have will be a rank because it's a process, not the uh, not the thread. But you know, it's very very similar to this. And um, of course, you can if def out of that for the preprocessor statement, um, and then also otherwise you could or you can just write it. Uh, so that you know if my rank is zero and if their count is one then you just do the standard stuff um 
and all pragmas begin with this pound pragma is for the preprocessor to to handle uh, and then the, the compiler will then create the loop bounds for each of the thread directly uh, on the serial source and also manage the data persist partitions and synchronizations through the barriers so if you see here a uh, pragma on parallel four and then a for loop this will automatically spin up the number of threads um, with this huge computation, presumably. Now you have to almost be careful to not spin up too many threads. So you should give enough work to each thread and to probably block them in other uh, structures, but that's not, we're not gonna go through that here, you know. But you get the idea at least. And like I say, there's still not all NY loops that can be parallelized. Uh, you need to make sure that the threads are created and iterations are divvied up and Ensure that the iteration count is predictable. You know that you you don't some, do something something funny. Uh, I can say it has implicit barrier at the beginning and end of each parallel construct, and after all other con uh, controls constructs. Uh, but you also can be removed with a no wait clause, uh, and it has the explicit comp synchronization that you can recognize from operating systems such as critical and atomic. So uh, for summary of the OpenMP, uh, it's basically a, a good for, it's not really a task, it's you know, a spending task, but it's just, you know, we can use also inside for loops. It's not completely natural if you want to write parallel code from scratch. It's not always possible to express certain common parallel constructs. And uh, there is some locality management and control for performance that is as hindered. Uh, but if you have a simple enough program that you can use OpenMP, it's definitely recommended that you do so. Now, the problem with OpenMP is that it limits itself to shared memory. And now if you have distributed memory, you know, hooking together many machines with each individual memories, you need to do something different. And that's where back we talked about what the dis versus same, we had this is the same slide that I showed before, distributed versus shared. And uh, that's why I wanted to mention the MPI message passing interface. Uh, you can really get away with six instructions, but there's over 100 available, and the rest of them you have to learn at least some of them in my course and maybe some more on your own. But you basically have to set up the environment with an MPI in it. You know, have an MPI com size that will tell you how many uh, processes you're spinning up and which number of the ID of your rank, which part, number of process ID you have. And there's a send and receive and finalize. And so for the MPI hello world, you see it's very, very uh, similar to the, to the OpenMP in this case, but you have explicit, explicitly for the, the, the root <coughs> that's sending the greeting, right? And then otherwise um, for, for all, the, all the other processes. And you can look at, and again, you know, you include the MPI library for with MPI.h. Now, that's the basically, uh, once you've thought that was too simple, there's even more complication if you want to use GPUs and AI techniques uh, for how to use, you know, um, multiple of these uh, GPUs uh, that, again, have both tensor cores and floating point units and stuff. So there are lots of challenges to uh, how we can do this. And many of my students have worked on these problems and hopefully several of you will want to join my lab in the future to continue to work on these problems. I find it very exciting. Um, and of course, I wanna thank my current master students and PhD students for keeping me inspired and also you for listening to me today. Thank you so much. And here's some of our application areas, but you can also come up with your own ideas. Yeah. How's that? That's great. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't think we have a virtual applause function here. Sorry for that. Thanks for your very interesting lecture, Deva Shempapa. <laughs> Was it hopefully interesting to the students too? Maybe not. <laughs> well, let's, oh yeah, we, we see virtual applause here. So yeah. I see at like least it. one or two nods. How's that? That's yes. good. All the other people with cameras off, who knows what they're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so I think it's it's 
also good to see that there's a, a direct link between what, what I'm doing, yeah, you know, on the compilers and OS side, what you are doing in the HPC side and, and the labs with parallel computing and also what our colleagues in hardware are doing. And so it's all interconnected. So, well, tr uh, like, like with Pokemons, try to catch all of them. So because yes, there's, so. A, there's a cluster of interesting lectures and courses out there. And I think if, if you can get the link, that's, that would prepare you for a, for a really interesting career later on in, in research or in, or in industry, because that's where the hot topics are right now. And somebody is asking about Rust, and I know I'm not the most familiar uh, person with Rust yet. I know some people swear by it. Uh, I have to admit I'm more of a C, C++ programmer, uh, but there's some definitely good things to be said about it, and I know a lot of people are looking into it. Well, the, the good thing about Rust is that you get rid of all these problems with manual memory management because it has this ownership idea and it really does static analysis on the uh, source code. Uh, so it so does a control data flow analysis. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, now, now the problem is this, this increases compile time significantly, but then you have memory safe code. So you yes. automatically get rid of like 50% of all the security problems you have with C and C++ code. Because still nowadays, one of the, the original bugs that was exploited by the Morris Worm, a buffer overflow, is still the, the cause for like more than half of all the security bugs in, in modern software. Now, I think uh, great, yeah, yeah. some great projects will be to look into Rust and see how certain HPC problems uh, can benefit from it and what the impacts of it would be. So that's, that's, that'd be a cool uh, you know, fall project for somebody to look into. Yeah, and, and also writing operating system code in Rust instead of C. So we, we should really consider like investigating whether Rust would be an, an interesting language to use in teaching actually to, Absolutely. yeah. Like C is 50 years old, now maybe it's time for something new. <laughs> and, and there's also another new language, it's, it's Go. Maybe you heard of this Go language, which is actually written by some of the uh, original Unix guys who later went on at Bell Labs to write Plan 9 and Inferno, which are two operating systems we're working in, in my group with. And so Go has interesting constructs for parallelism. So they have these so-called Go routines, which are based on coroutine concepts. And the theory behind this is communicating sequential processes by Tony Huar, a Sir Tony Huar. <laughs> uh, so, so a very, very predictable uh, parallel concept again, I think which you probably are also teaching in your course as, as basics, I would so, guess. Uh... So there are, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not teaching Go, but, uh, but I, yeah. the concepts, yes. Right. And, uh, and, you know, I'm a little bit of a uh, old school in that, you know, I've seen so many, you know, when I was assigned to summer job in 90, in 87 at, at IBM, you know, where we actually used four 3090 supercomputers, it's really the same, you know, because they were vector, each vector computer, you can think of those as four processors with each vectors today, you know, multiple processor so some of these concepts keep coming back you know yeah. so, so, and, so in, co in computer science we tend to reinvent the wheel every 20 years the biggest challenge is actually giving it a sexy new name right <laughs> that's right <laughs> so now we instead of call it grid computing we'll call it cloud computing and so on <laughs> right and, and of course we have edge and fog computing already and, and all that stuff <laughs> so yeah but but still the basic concepts and, and i think that's important because we 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 we, we insist on teaching not only applications, but these basic concepts. And that's important because if you know, as a student, this basic stuff, it doesn't really matter which technology you have to work with later on. If you know your basics, like how do you actually work with parallelization? How do you control data flow analysis? What happens when I choose a certain optimization? Why is there a problem with synchronization? And all this stuff interconnects what we are doing. Then, then this is really worthwhile. And that gives you a big advantage over students who just know how to apply stuff. And yeah, Anna mentioned like today, you could just copy stuff out from Stack Overflow. And we've just discussed this, you know, with the TAs that some students really love to prefer copying stuff from Stack Overflow instead of reading man pages. Sometimes it's good to go back to the basics and really try to figure out how stuff is going because it's relatively simple down low. If you manage to dig through all these layers of abstractions to get to the bare essentials of what's going on in computers. And that's what and, makes it interesting. Yeah, and hopefully what I was trying to do today was try to relate parallel computing and distributed computing and virtualization or and, and containerization to, to 
operating systems and virtualization. That's what I was trying to do. So hopefully you at least saw some connections there. Yeah. So somebody mentioned uh, Redox OS as a Rust written operating system. That's right. There's a large number of projects and even uh, Linus Torvalds just announced that they will open possibilities to include Rust code in the Linux kernel. I re still remember so. So my first Linux version was 0.12 in 1993. Installed <laughs> from like 35 floppy disks, and of course half of them were faulty. <laughs> and and I remember shortly after they tried to use C++ in the kernel and failed spectacularly. So they had to roll back all of this after investing lots of work, and that was the reason why they actually never wanted to do any experiments for the next like 25 years in using new languages. But it seems that there's a shift going on. And that's what's yeah. interesting. And of course, that's the, you know, Unix is the source of C, you know, that popularity of C was that, you know, they wanted a better language for, for, for uh, poor operating systems. And so that's how C came along. And of course, Bjarne Strostrup was the one that added more sort of abstractions to it. And he's the Danish, uh, as you know, from Denmark, uh, yes. but still, uh, I think he's now a consultant on Wall Street after he retired from uh, Texas A&M, uh, but that's not a, and he collaborates a lot with Magna Havidon at the University of Bergen here in Norway. So, you know, there's, he's done a, then done a lot of, lot of interesting things with templates and stuff with C++, but then I, you know, it's still getting, you know, like you say, old school for some people. But. Yeah, but I met him five years ago in Cambridge, actually, when he was giving a guest lecture. I mean, he's, he's long retired. And actually, his guest lecture was a one-hour apology for C++, which was fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but he's, he's a great guy. So it's really great to, to listen to him. So I would encourage everyone. So there's YouTube out there. You can listen to all the talks by all the great people who, who have worked in this industry for like 30 or 40 years. And that's great. Absolutely. By the way, uh, he also came from Bell Labs. So C++ was also invented that's at right. Bell Labs. Another right. technology. Which is, which, is, which is not surprising since Unix and C came from Bell Labs, right? Mm. Right, but the, the original Unix guys actually never uh, really picked up C++ because I think they didn't really. No, like no, it. they did C, they did C, <laughs> right. but they really, they really made C popular, is what I'm trying to say. Yes, and 50 years later, we still have to fight it. <laughs> but that's okay. I mean, imagine we would write everything in assembler still today. <laughs> Uh, I tried that at IBM that summer I told you about, and when I looked at the, the this matrix library, it was written by five different program, at least five different programmers, you know, and they all had their own ways of using the registers. And I'm trying to tell you, as a summer student, trying to look at the code and try to update that code, it was I spent like three weeks basically just <laughs> looking at a simple, you know, the the simple instruction, just figuring figuring out what the code was doing. It was so horrible. It's horrible. Yes. And uh, if you want to know the ultimate bad programming is. What they had to do at uh, Ikemarka down in because there were export restrictions on computers and limited memories and stuff in the olden days, so they would write code, assembly code, and overwrite it, overwrote itself as runtime to spare save memory. Now yeah, that is it, really vile because you try perfect. to debug that, it's just you know ugly. But that that's ex especially exploited nowadays because self modifying code is of course really really popular with virus and warm writers. So if you want to hide what your code is actually doing, you, you just write self-modifying code. So you exchange some of the opcodes of, of your machine language program on the fly. And I remember I, I taught a course on uh, malware analysis and reverse engineering in Germany a couple of years back. And that is still one of my favorite exam questions. This consisted of half a page of hexadecimal numbers and one short question, what's going on here? <laughs> and that included self-modifying code, and the students actually liked it. So yeah. <laughs> so there's there's lots of fun to to be had on lower levels. So even though if you start studying computer science, you might think everything's just Java and Python. The real good stuff is going on a number of abstraction layers below that. <laughs> but I, I like to keep it at the no lower than C. I have to admit. Now, if well, you want yeah. to do assembly, I will spit out assembly from C. How's that? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, as a compilers guy, of course, I need to work with assembly, obviously. <laughs> yes. I'm just saying, you know, as a programmer, I would spit out assembler before I just. Yeah, sure. No, nobody code, should program assembler. assembler by hand anymore. Definitely not. Nope, nope. I would write it out from C. Uh, unless <laughs> you're, you're a really big masochist, yes. <laughs> so uh, I was wondering, are there any more questions from the audience? Feel free to speak up on whatever interests you. 
And also, of course, questions on upcoming courses, honors courses, yeah, you, what you can expect. You're generally third year, third year students, right? So you These all should be third year students. Yes. Yeah. So you all should, are qualified to take my parallel computing class this fall. So I guess I've hereby Excellent. advertised a lot for it. To right. TDT and, and... And as, we, as we've mentioned, if you want access to these great new NVIDIA 3090 cards, <laughs> they're all in Anna's lab. <laughs> and you have the screens to, to match them. So yes, it's a great lab. <laughs> but I think you don't have any sound cards installed. So gaming isn't that much fun, right? <laughs> what do you mean I don't have any what? Uh... The sound cards for... <laughs> so. Oh, 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 we have, uh, well, there are headsets, you know, there's... Uh... Oh, yeah, you got headsets, so you, you can actually also listen to whatever noise your great first-person shooter which you can generate in the off hours when nobody's watching what the students are doing in the lab. Yeah, we have great uh, <laughs> game parties. We have great game parties on our 80-inch 80 80 screen on Friday nights, right? <laughs> ah, okay. You never told me. <laughs> well... <laughs> yeah, so... Uh... Well, we have, you know... Uh, was it the Guitar Hero and, uh, and uh, yeah, a few other things. I probably shouldn't uh, talk about it. <laughs> sounds, sounds good. I bought yeah. it with my own money so people can't. Uh... <laughs> yes, that's better. Yeah, and, and especially if you're interested you like in, in really old computer technology, because that's what we're not teaching, actually. We're not teaching the history of computer science. We have an excellent collection of stuff. And I would be happy if students would really be motivated to get some of that stuff actually working again. To, to actually get an impression of what computing was like in the 1970s, 1980s, when you had like hard disks that weighed like a hundred kilos, or yeah, you had the first computers had, was, was a graphical user interface that worked on like 128 kilobytes of RAM. And I think that's fascinating. So today, everything's more or less free. You get like gigabytes of RAM and a couple of processors almost for a couple of hundred euros or, or a couple of thousand kronas. And back then, a single a small computer set you back the price of, of, a, of a nice house in Norway, right? <laughs> and and so if you're interested in this, just a little bit more of this ATAS stuff, um, you know, some history. I, I wrote this, I wrote this really a little article re recently. Let's see if I can get it. Well, oh, will not work. Mm. Hmm? Everyone. Yeah, I, th I think when Corona is finally over, we should do some fireside chats in the evening with for students who are really interested in, you know, getting a bit more of a background and maybe invite some more people like I, I would imagine Lasse Natvik would, would be able to tell lots of interesting stories about his, well, last, I don't know, 40 something years at NTNU. <laughs> yeah, people want copies of my slides, so I'll try to uh, generate a PDF and send you, um, Mikhail, I guess you have yes. a... Thank you. Uh, yes. Blackboard or something for the students? Is that yeah, yeah, sure. We'll, we'll just link it on the web page. It's it's just uh, I, I put it on a regular handwritten HTML web page, so it's handcrafted web. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, so just you, because you want me to I, put it somewhere? Oh no, I, I'll I'll just link it there. That's perfectly fine because that's where all the other stuff is linked, and also the videos which I upload on YouTube. Because to be honest, every time I have to use Blackboard, I'm wondering like. Why on earth are we paying money for this? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. So anyway, hope you are in. Hope you enjoy this lecture, and maybe you know, I'll get to see some of you in fall. And of course, I'm going to be around uh, for questions if you want to hear some more. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot again. That was a great talk, and I think our students really, yeah, looks like they enjoyed it. That's great. So. Uh, what's next on the OS course? Essentially, we're finished with teaching material contents stuff. So next week we'll have the final two lectures and we'll do a, uh, yeah, essentially reprise of the course. So we are going through what's important uh, for the exam, especially in like a 90 minute session. And then in the last session, I will discuss uh, solutions to our example exam. And this will hopefully come out this evening if I manage to finish it today. And then you should all be well prepared for everything. So, so I guess my lecture was a little bit of a pre pre review or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. That fit but in hopefully, very well. Hopefully, yeah. with enough little new nuggets to get excited about doing. Yes, some yes, definitely. All right. All right. So Take shall care. we call the day? Thanks a lot again, Anna.
see You're you welcome. soon. And Bye. yeah, thanks everyone for joining our session here. And see you again, maybe next week in a Zoom session for the course. All right. Yes, and thank you to those who are showing your faces and thank you for all those who also participated. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.